Washington Journal continues. We're back with Catherine Waldron, who is a National Security and Cybersecurity Resident Fellow at the R Street Institute, and we're going to talk about 2020 election security. Good morning. Good morning. So first of all, tell us what the R Street Institute is and where y'all get your funding. So we're a think tank here in D.C. We're a nonprofit. We're nonpartisan. Uh, we get our funding from a wide variety of foundations and other donors, um, but most of it, we're all independent. So if, they're, if you're paying us, you agree with what we think. <laughs> okay. So you wrote an article entitled, Friendly Fire, the Number One Threat to America's Election Cybersecurity. Tell me what you mean by friendly fire. So most of the focus um, after 2016 has been on people trying to get you know, people outside the U.S. trying to get into our systems, the Russians, essentially. Uh, but when I was writing the piece, one of the things that I realized that we weren't really talking about was that, you know, cybersecurity requires you to focus on both offense and defense. Mm -hmm. And so we've been talking about the Russians and defense, but we haven't talked about the threat that comes from not having an appropriate um, defense, essentially, not having appropriate training for our own election security uh, workers and our own uh, poll workers. Now, what type of training do election workers and poll workers get and what type should they get when they when it comes to cybersecurity? That's a great question. So unfortunately, um, poll workers and election workers, there is no uniform standard for training. Um, so it really depends on not across your state and even your local county and jurisdiction as to what sort of training you're receiving. So this can vary wildly depending on where you're located. So most poll workers are trained by the local county um, election officers. Sometimes states do get involved to require certain types of training, um, but this training can really vary all over the place. Um, but because of the shift towards um, the real need to protect against cyber threats, uh, I'm deeply concerned that people aren't getting the appropriate amount of cyber training specifically. Now, who do, uh, just to be sp specific, sorry, yeah. can't get it out this morning, <laughs> just to be specific, who do election workers and poll workers work for? Do they work for the cities? Do they work for the counties? Do they work for the states? Do they work for the federal government? Who's in charge? Mm -hmm. So it depends. The most elections are run um, by local officials. Obviously, there are state employees that impact elections, but the most um, poll workers volunteer for their local county or jurisdiction. And so if, if anyone does the training, it's going to be local officials, it's not local the state officials, officials not federal yeah. officials. Yeah, exactly. And this is just poll training, but we are specifically talking about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest concern we have right now for cybersecurity? Are we, should we be worried more about foreign interference or should we really be worried more about local inter interference, interference from inside America? Where should our concern be? Well, I think it's appropriate to be concerned about interference on a wide variety of levels. Certainly, you know, the Russians were very active during the last campaign, uh, and we should expect that they will be active during 2020 as well. Uh, however, it, we should not ignore potential threats that come in from America, either malicious threats, but also unintentional human error, which can frequently plague elections. Define what you mean by unintentional human error. Are you talking about someone um, using a easily guessed password? Are you talking about someone spilling coffee on a computer? What do you mean by unintentional human error? Definitely, it could be both of those. It could be a wide variety of mistakes. These are people who, you know, they're everyday Americans, they're well-intentioned, they're here, they're serving their country, um, but, you know, they slip up, they make a mistake. Maybe they spill that coffee on, on their laptop, but maybe it's, it's a password they don't intend that's too easy to, to break, to hack into. Maybe it's, um, a election, a voting machine that's been left plugged in when it ought to be disconnected from the internet. Let's let our viewers get in, uh, get take part in this conversation. We're talking about 2020 election security. If you want to get in on this conversation, we're going to open up our regular lines this morning. That means Republicans, you can call in at 202-748-8001. Democrats, your lines 202-748-8000. Independence, you can call 202-748-8002. Remember, you can always text us your questions and comments at 202-748-8003. And we're always reading on social media, on Twitter at CSPANWJ and on Facebook at facebook.com slash CSPAN. Now, Catherine, is there any 
type of cybersecurity training at all for election and poll workers, or is it just whatever the local officials decide they want to do? So there are great resources available. As I said before, many states have enacted some form of required training. Um, so if you're in one of those states, like Oklahoma has been very involved in like poll worker training um, since the 2000s, then you probably have some sort of cyber training at least going towards your state and local ele election officials. Um, however, uh, DHS also has a wide variety of resources available. So they have um, free training available for state and local um, employees that covers cybersecurity and election security. And they also have great resources available in regards to um, assessments that election organizations can, um, can ask for that will um, assess essentially how good is their cybersecurity? You know, how susceptible are they to phishing attempts? Uh, they can they can do pen testing, penetration testing to see um, w in what sort of scenarios they would be vulnerable to hackers. Now we have a question that's coming in from one of our social media followers, and let's see, I, I had it here and it seems to have vanished on me, but here we go. Which states? We have a question coming in from Catherine. Catherine wants to know. Which states have voting machines that are connected to the internet? Or do all states have voting machines that are connected to the internet? How internet connected is voting in the United States? Um, great question. And actually, almost very few, almost no machines, voting machines are connected to the internet. Um, so you can rest assured that um, your machines are far more secure probably than you think. Now, we have found some instances where voting machines have modems in them. Um, that connect to cell phone networks, which can then be connected to, to the internet. These, um, they are not supposed to be connected, obviously, during the elections process. You do hear some stories of instances where um, workers either forgot to disconnect um, the modem. And so that's one example of you know, a potential human error that we want to avoid for the sake of security. Let's talk to Stacy, who's calling from McLean, Virginia, on the independent line. Stacy, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, America. Um, I have some concerns as an election board officer. I'm concerned that our government is not taking these, not our government, the Republicans, let's be honest, they're not taking these um, attacks on our election seriously. In fact, they're doing things to block um, election security. And, and I can assure you, Eleanor, Richard, or myself is no match for a government who has waged war against the county or precinct. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about what you're doing or what we're trying to do to get those Republicans on board to protect our elections? And also, why did Ivanka Trump need to go to China to get patents for voting machines. What was that about? Do you know anything about that? So I think you bring up a really great point, which is the need um, to really get both parties on board with supporting election security. Um, election security needs to be a bipartisan issue. It really addresses the foundation um, of American democracy. And so I think the partisan nature of today's politics has created difficulties in figuring out how to appropriately address cybersecurity. There was a report recently um, released by the Senate Intelligence Committee that acknowledged that the very partisan nature of politics um, slowed um, the Obama administration's response to the 2016 interference because the parties disagreed on how to appropriately address um, the interference at the time. And so absolutely, in order to really address um, security at any Im at any impactful level. We need to have both parties on board. I want to read from your article a little bit and have you elaborate on it. Here's what you wrote. While problems with voting technology can bedevil any election, as was amply illustrated by the chaos surrounding the Iowa Democratic caucuses, human error is a major vulnerability in any voter system. Tales of worker error in elections range from optical scanners left unplugged to distribution of ballots to the wrong precinct. One study of poll workers in California reported several such breaches of standard operating procedure, including leaving a memory card with vote totals at the polling site at the end of the day and leaving the door to a ballot box 
unlocked. Now, are poll, all poll workers volunteers, and should they now, should we make them paid employees with required training before working at polls? So most po poll workers are recruited. They are volunteers in that sense, but a lot of them do actually receive some form of compensation. Um, this may not be a very much compensation, um, but a lot of them do, re do receive something. Um, and most of them do actually undergo training. So most states have some sort of requirement that they are required to go through some amount of training. Now, this training can be a bit of a barrier sometimes in terms of recruiting poll workers. Certain, um, lo certain localities, especially urban areas, can struggle to recruit the required number mm -hmm. of poll workers, which is perhaps one reason why um, local officials may be wary of increasing the training requirements because they're concerned about actually having enough people to run um, polling stations. Let's talk to David, who's calling from Orange Park, Florida, on the Republican line. David, good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Catherine. Catherine, my question is, is can you give me a specific example of Russian interference in the election? I, to be honest with you, I think it's a hoax. Uh, but just a specific example of how the Russians interfered with the election in 2016 and how they might do it in 2020? Absolutely. Great question. Um, thanks for asking. Uh, so we happen to know that the Russians have probed almost all of the voter data registration bases um, in states, and we do know that they actually managed to breach um, a database in Illinois. Now, it doesn't look like they changed any voter data. It doesn't look like um, that was impacted, but the fact that they were able to get into the system at all is very, very alarming. Um, so that's something I think we should be wary about in 2020, which is their access to our voter uh, databases, essentially. Let's talk to Dan, who's calling from Georgetown, Massachusetts, on the independent line. Dan, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. Uh, just to that last answer, um, public voting data is it's public information. So if, if anyone wants to get it, that's public information for anyone to see who, how people are registered. So that's not a Russian hack. Um, where there is evidence of hacking is, uh, let's just go back to the Bush-Gore, uh, Bush versus Gore. The Supreme Court chose the president of the United States. That's when things started to go off the rails. We'll go after that. John Kerry versus George Bush. The George Bush win was a statistical anomaly based on exit poll data. What we used, to, what we hold other countries to the a standard of using exit polls to get a check and balance on other countries' elections, we have now diminished. And now what we do with our exit poll data is we have two companies collaborate together to do exit poll data, and then they receive that raw data, and then they hold on to it, and it's secret, and no one's allowed to share any of it until the actual poll numbers come out, and then they massage the data to match up with the so-called counted votes. Our system, there is no check and balance whatsoever in our entire voting system. And I think we're getting a really good look on the Democrat side, how corrupt it is. The Democratic Party, undemocratic process of electing their people, it's absurd. Our Go ahead and respond. So I think the caller brings up a really good point, which is how do we verify the, um, the, authentic the authenticity of our election results? Um, and this is something that I think actually a lot of states are starting to embrace um, a new way of auditing, which is risk limiting auditing, um, which is a way, uh, it's more statistically sound than previous auditing um, behaviors and, or uses in the past. Um, and so certain states, Colorado has jumped on board with this. Um, quite a variety of states are now requiring or adopting um, this type of auditing so that we can actually verify our election results. Now, um, 
Is cybersecurity training required for poll workers in all 50 states, or is it only certain states that require it? Well, as I said before, the training in different states really depends um, on the state, the local uh, election official, and what they choose to address. Mm -hmm. um, and re remember that most of these trainings, these are not like extensive trainings. So poll workers need to be trained um, on security, but they also need to be trained on you know, how to use the machines, all, all the daily day-to-day -day, um, activities that are going to be going on on election day. So even if cybersecurity is, dress, is addressed briefly, this might only be a four-hour training that they're going through. Some, sometimes it's far less, actually. Um, so just because something's brought up doesn't mean that someone is adequately trained in it. So what would you suggest if you were given, put in charge of cybersecurity <laughs> for the U.S. election system, what would you suggest that local and state officials tell poll workers about cybersecurity? What are some of the tips that they should be telling them? Well, obviously, depending, depending on what you're doing that particular day, it probably depends on the cybersecurity tips you need. In general, obviously, there's always um, training about phishing, about passwords. Uh, okay, just make sure everyone doesn't know what phishing yeah. is. Define phishing for us. So phishing, it, those are those emails you get you know, um, the ones where they've got that link that you're really not supposed to click, um, that most of us have clicked at some point in our lives. Um, and so training like that, you know, practice emails saying, oh, you know, don't click on that link that says, oh, here's where you go to change your password when really your password is fine. Um, or, you know, there are more broader forms of phishing that could be threats to election. For example, um, sending out an email that says, hey, you can vote here um, would be a very problematic example of a phishing campaign. Let's talk to Kevin, who's calling from Lando Lakes, Florida, on the Republican line. Kevin, good morning. Good morning, uh, and good morning, Catherine. Um, I was calling because uh, you said there's a couple of ways that the election can be impacted, that being from uh, adversaries, the Russian, China, and we always talk about Russia. We never mention China or some of our other adversaries. But more importantly, the ones right at home, illegal aliens that are now given driver's licenses in mostly Democratic states, and they're going to go vote. So every citizen that, that votes and then a non-citizen votes, they cancel your vote. And I know that in 2016, not one vote was changed by any uh, adversaries. But I'm curious how many votes were changed by illegal aliens coming in and voting in our system. You know, I can't give you the numbers on that. Um, but once again, statistically, research has shown that voter fraud is not a huge issue in the United States. Um, but I do think that this concern um, about, once again, the authenticity um, of our elections is actually one of those um, disagreements that the Russians and other foreign adversaries look to exploit. Um, when creating distrust in the American political system at large. We have another um, social media follower who says this, as a former election official, one suggestion is that precincts make an effort to recruit a proportion of younger workers. I'd like to see college students recruited as part of their community service. It's important to get them involved early on. Now, as a frequent voter, we know we go to the voting polls and all of the poll workers, at least a lot of them, look to be older. Is that a, first of all, do we know the average age of poll workers in the United States? And is that a problem when it comes to cybersecurity? So um, the, elect, the EAC, the Election Assistance Committee, did do a survey um, of poll workers in 2016. Uh, poll workers actually span a wide variety of ages. There are plenty of older poll workers, but there are also quite a few programs um, aimed at recruiting younger poll workers from college and even high school. Um, a lot of um, states do require poll workers be 18 up, but then they might have additional youth recruitment programs to try to foster a sense of civic engagement um, and to encourage volunteering at that younger level. Um, certainly, younger poll workers might come in more adept uh, already adept at technology, but there's no reason to assume that older poll workers aren't equally adept or can't learn um, cybersecurity and technology training as well. Let's talk to Richard, who's calling from Nashville, Tennessee, on the independent line. Richard, good morning. Good morning, uh, C-SPAN and guests and commentators and everybody at C-SPAN. Good morning. 
But what I would like for the election commission, I mean, I'm in Nashville, of course. It's a growing metroplex of a city. I mean, I would like to see the American people, I think, need to understand what happens on a state. There's around 90-something counties in Tennessee, and that's about the, for that size state around the country, about 90 to 100 counties. I don't understand why we're in such a rush to get through any election. We vote on Tuesday. You know, we got Super Tuesday to be coming up, and every election is a Tuesday, a Tuesday. Think about it. Most young students that can vote are in college classes. Most people are working paycheck to paycheck. They want to vote. They can't vote. Now, I'd like for the young lady to talk about the structure of each town county if there's 200 people in a county or if there's a million people in a county and let's have a week of elections and let's make sure that those people i don't mind a young person in high school being you know 16 to 18 working in there but i think they should have a mentor most people in my church most people where i i vote and i voted all my life they're 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 older because they're retired and they want to still be active in the community. So if you took a young person and mentored them with an older person, yeah, you may get a liberal view, you may get a conservative view, but at the same time, they learn from each other. The youth are very smart when it comes to uh, secu- you know internet and all that. And I would love to see us get away from the computer and get back to paper ballots and do it county to county and spread it out through the week so we have that time. We're not in a rush. A rush, never rush through anything, buying a home, buying a car, getting married, or anything. I'll now close on that. Thank you. So I think you bring up some really good points. Um, number one is that, yes, um, it is actually one of the difficulties in recruiting um, poll workers and, and volunteers in general is that a lot of people are working um, or in classes during that time. And so I think that is one reason why we do see so many older um, poll, uh, poll workers volunteer um, is that they're retired. Um, so that's a really good point to bring up. Um, and the second really good point that you brought up that I'd like to address um, is you mentioned paper ballots and the need to get back towards that. And I I and many, many um, election security experts would agree with you that paper ballots, um, especially in light of 2016, are a very important component. And so actually um, a lot of um, machines do, rec- either they have some form, of, you either vote with a paper ballot or there is now a way to verify with a paper trail. Um, and in light of 2016, actually a lot of states have moved, um, states that didn't have paper ballots incorporated as part of their system have now moved um, to incorporating some form of paper trail. And that is really, really important um, for being able to verify uh, election results. Let's look at this. Shelby Pearson, who's the Intelligent Community's first election czar, was at an event here in Washington last month and talked about how the government is countering foreign interference in this year's elections. Here's what here's what Shelby said. I appreciate the spectrum of tools that are available not only to the intelligence community but to the United States government to counter foreign influence. Um, speaking for the intelligence community, first and foremost, we seek to not only collect against this activity and develop insights those insights are critical not only to inform our policymakers so that they could make good decisions, but I think even more so to develop a level of expertise so that we anticipate these moves before they happen and provide the greatest amount of decision space for our leaders um, uh, in order to best defend the United States. That can also find its way into providing intelligence that supports our diplomatic engagements, um, which could range from working with our allies, which is such a strong component of the IC, all the way to informing how best uh, State Department can demarche uh, uh, countries that are potentially looking into this activity. It also can inform, intelligence can inform um, the designations uh, for sanctions. And I think you've seen a certain surge in sanctions recently in terms of a major policy mechanism by which we try to um, Um, impose costs and have consequences for this type of activity. This also then on the other hand, uh, I think several other tools that are available to us, um, one to help our colleagues, for example, in Cyber Command, 
um, develop their own capabilities to target and stop this type of activity on the network before it even happens. And I think also, which also gets a lot of attention, is the downgrading of intelligence information, which can be challenging um, to share that with network defenders and those that are involved in um, influ influence operations or social media companies or tech companies so that they can use that to better defend um, their network. So I think we've, it's not just downgrading classified information, and I recognize there's a heavy premium on that work, but there's a full spectrum of tools that I think that the IC either has in their toolkit or we use to inform um, a broader uh, level of activities across the government. Now, Catherine, is, is there a role for the federal government, specifically for the Department of Homeland Security, in securing um, the upcoming fall election and working with state officials? Absolutely, and DHS has been very active um, so far in engaging with state and local official, officials and having a wide number of resources available. As I mentioned before, they've been involved in providing training, they've been involved in um, creating information sharing centers so that state and local officials can actually share information with one another, hear information about threats coming in, um, and there is absolutely a role for the federal government to play. Let's talk to Thomas, who's calling from Rogers City, Michigan, on the independent line. Thomas, good morning. Hello, uh, oh, this is Tom Bruin, an elder in the tribe, Sioux City Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. And I'm just wondering how, how the polling is uh, going to be working for the 521 federally recognized tribes in, across the United States. We all, uh, we all are going to vote. <clears throat> but we have never been able to really run for elective office in our own tribe. And we just want to know uh, how many uh, federally recognized tribes can be affected by this next election. I believe he was asking about the uh, voting systems for the uh, federally recognized Indian tribes in the United States. That one's outside of my scope of purview, so I won't, I won't comment on that one. But. Okay. Uh, let's go to Jim, who's calling from Cairo, Missouri, on the Democratic line. Jim, good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's see. Uh, and Jim, before you get started, let me ask you one quick question. Do you pronounce it Missouri or Missouri? Missouri. Missouri, okay. We were having a debate about that this morning. Go ahead. I was born in New Jersey, so. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um. A paper ballot mailed to every voter may increase the voter turnout and would also provide a paper trail. But what concerns me more than the actual count of the vote is the results of the vote. Apparently, Republicans get more seats with less votes. The uh, 48 um, senators that voted to um, impeach represented 12 million more people than the 50-something that voted to acquit. We are in a, a state of minority rule. And I defy anybody, any American out there to declare the man that comes in number two as the winner. That is not the American way. Thank you. Now, uh, several callers and several people online have brought up the idea of a mail-in ballot mm -hmm. or going back to some form of paper ballots, taking the computers completely out of the equation. Is that even possible in today's society to hold a statewide or a national election without a computer? Well, it's certainly possible because you have to remember that national and statewide elections are actually just small local elections. It's just a whole conglomeration of them. Um, and many uh, jurisdictions do uh, vote with paper ballots, and, and those paper ballots are collected to be, they can either be optically scanned um, at a later point, scanned at the moment, um, and then, but there are a variety of options that are also hybrids. Um, there are um, quite a few voting machines where, you know, you, you press a button on the computer, but then it creates a paper ballot that you can verify at that moment, so it creates a paper trail as well. Um, I do think it's very, very important to have some form of paper trail involved. Um, Mail-in ballots is one option, uh, though you could imagine a myriad of issues with that as well, but certainly incorporating paper and marrying that back into the system is incredibly important. Now, um, we've heard a lot about Russian interference 
in the United States elections. Um, what are the other threats to the election systems from foreign actors? Is it just Russia or are we looking at other countries doing this? And one question that has come up before, does the United States do this to other countries? So Russia is, has obviously been the main focus thanks to the activities they engaged in, in the 2016 um, campaign. We do, there are a variety of other countries that um, are considered some of America's like top cyber adversaries. So China has been mentioned before, um, North Korea, Iran. Um, we haven't seen them engage in the same type of um, activity and interference in regards to our election um, security. Uh, there, that's not to rule out that they couldn't engage in that type of behavior in the future. Certainly they all engage in cyber activities um, that are harmful to the United States. Mm -hmm. So outside of Russia, mm -hmm. are there any other specific countries we should be looking at? China, North Korea, India, England, anyone? Um, probably China is the next biggest adversary. Um, Iran, simply because um, of the way political tensions have been going um, hot and cold with them mm -hmm. lately. So. Let's talk to Tom, who's calling from uh, Pequot Lakes, Minnesota, on the Republican line. Tom, did I pronounce the name of your town correctly, uh, Pequot Lakes? Yes, it is, sir. All uh, right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Catherine, uh, some of the other callers kind of took my thunder, and my question was, why can't we simplify this system with paper ballots, have maybe the valedictorians of the high school count them? Um, and we saw in the Iowa caucus the um, the problems with redeveloping some software. Um, my second part would be exactly what did the Russians do to affect the election specifically to affect it? I, I know they had maybe a hundred thousand dollars of um, ads on Facebook, but how did they change the voting in our country? Um, I really never heard any good specifics on that one. Thanks for your question, um, or really questions, um, both of which are important, both of which I want to address. Um, first off, in regards to Russia, um, it's, it's actually very difficult to pinpoint the exact amount of influence the Russians had. Certainly they launched a massive disinformation campaign through political ads, um, and we know um, that, that has impacted voters, but we don't know to what extent did that change voters' minds? Did it simply um, reinforce preconceived um, opinions? Uh, that we don't know. We also know that they did probe um, many of our um, computer systems that, in regards to election systems, so that is also something to be concerned, but once again, it doesn't look like any actual voter data was changed in any way. Um, but also, in regards to your previous comment about paper ballots and Iowa, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, because I think the Iowa caucus uh, debacle is a really good example, actually, of, um, first off, how human error, um, even very well-intentioned people, um, if, if they're not running a, an app or a program that's been appropriately vetted and appropriately tested, can lead to all sorts of chaos. Um, and that even fairly low-tech options can still, still have their own um, security risks. So yes, adding paper ballots back in will help simplify things. Most states um, have actually added that back in. I think there were 14 states in 2016 who had local jurisdictions or counties um, that had some form of elections voting machine that did not have a paper audit trail. Um, since then, many of those states, I think at least half of them, either have or will have incorporated paper, a paper trail in some way. Since this question seems to be coming up over and over, let's be very specific here. As far as we know, in 2016, did any foreign country or any foreign actor actually, was they, were they actually able to change any votes for in the national elections? As far as we know, the answer to that is no. Correct. correct? So, but what we do know is that Russian connected hackers targeted election systems in 21 states. Yes. And they succeeded in voting in breaching a voter database in Illinois. Yes. They were, so they targeted them and they breached one voter database. Yes. But as far as we know, they did not change any votes that were cast in 2016. Correct. Now, the vulnerabilities that allowed them to do that in 2016, do we know if those vulnerabilities have been shored up and where the, that method can't be used again? 
I think most of them have been shored up, but the unfortunate thing about cybersecurity is that you know there are constantly new vulnerabilities. It's really cybersecurity, the vulnerabilities are really only limited by the hacker's imagination, um, which is why it's equally important for us to be constantly you know, involved in testing, rigorous, rigorous testing um, of all of our information systems so that we can be constantly looking for new vulnerabilities. Now, do we know how those hacking, how they were able to breach that database? Do we know how they were able to target those election systems? Well, they, they targeted both those, those systems in both states and even in the U.S. territories um, in a variety of different ways. Um, once, Name one for us. Um, so, um, phishing, obviously, phishing. yeah, um, among, uh, among others. So, yeah, they, they're, the Russians are very creative. Um, so in regards, yeah, they involved, were engaged in that, they engaged in disinformation, um, yeah, they engaged in a wide spread of activities. Let's go to John, who's calling from Lincoln, Nebraska, on the Democratic line. John, good morning. Well, I've been an election board official for approximately 25 years. I've held a couple of different positions on the board. Currently, I supervise the board. And it, it's always my... I've always found we've been well-trained. We have to have a mandatory training before every election, primary or general, mm -hmm. all the board members. Uh, and they, they're very thorough in those trainings. Uh, there have been a number of changes every year with the legislature, federal law, state law that have affected us, but they always cover that. That training aside, the one constant that we have always had in, in my precinct has been a paper ballot. I mean, I've seen my precinct geographically. It's gone from a very large geographic area to approximately an area that's probably one fifth the size it used to be because of population growth. That's been a major change, but we still have the same number of uh, voters in our precinct approximately as we had 20 years ago, but it's become a much more compact precinct because of the growth. But the constant all through this has been that paper ballot, and I really don't want to see that go away. So that's my comment. I think, I think that's fantastic um, that your precinct has been so wonderful about training. Um, despite my comments um, and concerns about the need to um, increase training, I do think that there are probably many, many um, jurisdictions out there who are doing a wonderful job with their training, and that should be commended. Certainly, um, and and I reiterate my point and and um, yours as well that paper ballots um, really are an important part of um, securing the security of American elections. Let's look at one more video. VJ D'Souza, who leads the cybersecurity team at the Government Accountability Office, was on this program earlier this week, and he talked about how the Department of Homeland Security is supporting local election officials. Here's what he had to say. Uh, they do cybersecurity assistance. Uh, they have staff in the field and at DHS headquarters that can provide assistance for a number of different cybersecurity issues. They can do things like assessing susceptibility to phishing. I think we all have heard of phishing attacks where people get a suspicious email, so they can help different organizations uh, look at you know how susceptible they are to those sorts of things. Um, they also can help with planning as far as planning for what could go wrong and what if something does go wrong. One of the things they've done that's fairly low tech but I think was fairly well received is these posters are called last mile posters and each locality has uh, a number of different localities have requested them. They kind of lay out different steps in incident response or different security measures that these localities are taking. Let's take one more caller and let's talk to Harry who's calling from Conyers, Georgia, on the independent line. Harry, good morning. Good morning. I'd like to uh, bring up uh, the idea of changing election days to from Tuesdays to the weekend or a holiday. Why not? If these elections are so important and the vote is so important, why not have elections on the weekend, or a holiday set aside for this very important action. Also, number two, I was raised as a child to be an example. Family members look at them as examples. 
athletes, look at them as examples. Neighbors, look at them as examples. Military, politicians. What's going on here? What is happening in America? I love this country. Would changing the date of, of the elections from Tuesdays or making it a longer week or moving it to a weekend, would that help cybersecurity at all? Well, it might help in the sense that if people have a day off already, you know, it might be easier to recruit poll workers in general. Um, you might be able to recruit people who, you know, were cybersecurity specialists um, already in the field. People wouldn't be required to take time off work or time off classes in order to come um, either vote in the polls or volunteer at the polls. Let's take one more caller and let's talk to Renee, who's calling from Starkville, Mississippi on the independent line. Renee, good morning. Good morning. Um, I think I need to reemphasize that there was no Russian attempts to hack state election systems. Uh, the only attempt that we know of is that Barack Obama's Department of Homeland Security was the only entity caught trying to break into a state election system. Brian Kemp, the Secretary of State of Georgia, caught the Homeland Security trying to break into the, uh, the state system without uh, their knowledge or permission. So I want to emphasize, because you made the, um, the implication that the Russians were trying to hack our state election system, and that's simply not the case. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Do you agree with that? Well, it is fairly well documented that the Russians um, were engaged in trying to um, breach our elections last, uh, in 2016. Um, the report that was released, the Senate Intelligence Report, it was a bipartisan report. Um, so it's, it's generally well agreed upon. If you had to offer state and local officials one final list or one final tip on securing cybersecurity for the upcoming elections, what would it be? Test and train everyone and ev all systems you use rigorously. As I think we've seen um, in Iowa, rolling out new tech at the last minute, not appropriately uh, testing it, not training people on it appropriately, um, can lead to all sorts of disasters, even if you know there's no foreign interference going on at the moment. Um, so tr train people rigorously, test systems rigorously, let's not do the Russians' jobs for them. We'd like to thank Catherine Waldron, National Security and Cyber Security Resident Fellow at the R Street Institute for coming and spending time with us this morning and talking about 2020 election security. Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up next, we'll be joined by Inez Stepman of the Independent Women's Forum, and she'll be here to talk about efforts to revive the Equal Rights Amendment. We'll be right back. <music> 